things that they need to know about is the hardships that we had to incur uh, in those days. I came here in 49 and there was a lot of people up here, you know, because I guess whatever they could get to build a house, uh, they would build it and uh, they would live in it. And I know one lady, they was living down here at the house across the street over there. And they lived in a tent for a long time. They had no zoning laws at that time. And what you put up was yours and it was your palace, <laughs> except it didn't always look like a palace. And if you can look at the houses today, they compare like they are palaces to what some of the houses were like earlier before there was zoning. As a little girl, we didn't have running water. We didn't have streets, uh, street lights out here. Everything was uh, dark. Um, as I got older, um, we first got our first well. I think I was maybe eight or nine years old when we first got our well. Uh, in our yard, and even though the water wasn't clear, we would have, my mom would always have to get the water out the well and actually boil it before we could drink it or cook with it. It wasn't a, a convenient place to live. You know, they had outhouses, and they had hand pumps, and, you know, so, and those were not things convenient to a nice quality way of living, let's put it that way, you know. We, we didn't have running water where you just go in there and turn on a faucet. You had to prime the pump with a little water, <laughs> and then you had to pump the pump to get the water out. And uh, I guess uh, we was kind of up there for a minute cause we had uh, a double seated outhouse. <laughs> uh, yeah, deluxe. <laughs> a deluxe outhouse. Yeah, yeah. hey, <laughs> boy, two one. of y'all could go out there and use the bathroom at the same time. You know, we walked up these streets and, uh, well, streets, roads in the mud and what not, you know, and then like uh, one of my friends was telling him, uh, cars couldn't come up in the winter time because they get stuck in the, in the middle of the road, you know. So the people had to get their groceries and what not down on Richner Road at that time, which is now Haddon Road. They had to get their groceries from there. And uh, uh, it was hard on some of them because they had to lug all this stuff up, all the way up the streets in the snow to their homes, you know. And their homes weren't uh, weren't too much at that time. And actually the plumbing came in, what was it, 1970? The early, early 1970s, we started getting inside, mm -hmm. you know, bathrooms and things. Yeah. Which yeah, was I quite went, a while, you know. <laughs> yeah. I went into the Army in 63, and uh, when I came home in 65, my dad and them still had outhouses. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they started to bring in the water and the sewers then mm -hmm. at that time. And they used to have a big truck. We call him the honey man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a big truck would come and suck all the, you yeah, know, the outside toilets, you know, stuff out. We call him the honey man. There's words for it, but <laughs> <laughs> and you know, going away until uh, how, that's how, about how awful was that? About what? Uh, but every six oh, months, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like yeah but uh, anyway, so. we yeah. call him the honey man, you know. Yeah. But he would come and suck out the toilets, you know, for us, and <laughs> and then they broke down in Hudson there. One year, and <laughs> you remember that? It exploded in Hudson. Yeah, I did. The yeah. whole load just went berserk down on oh. Main Street there in Hudson. And boy, they talked about that for a long time. It was in the paper. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, he had a wooden Because, you know, I mean, yeah, that's it was wood. wood. Yeah, you know, it was a wooden truck. <laughs> and he terrible. dropped his load right there. Yeah. Right there on Main Street. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing just went so hard. Yeah, the honey man. Oh, that oh, was my something. goodness. Yeah. In terms of getting roads fixed, when I was a child, the roads were made of dirt. Um, every summer they would come by in the oil truck and actually lay a coating of oil across the dirt to keep the dust down because it was a dusty road and then lay gravel on top of that. We had to fight to get roads. We had to fight to get plumbing. We had to fight for just the basic necessities that other folks took for granted. He's getting more like the white folks every day sung by Mr. Bert Williams of Williams and Walker.
never seen such a monster scene since the day that I was born. Has bounced up here in the last few weeks between me and Sally Hall. I enjoyed them. What I enjoyed the most, um, I like looking through all the um, newspaper clippings and scanning it into the computer. Who was the most influential enemy you said that why? Um, the most, uh, the most, <laughs> the most influential uh, interview subject for me was Lucian White. I just thought he gave really good uh, detail about things that you would find in history books, like just like racist incidents, like people hiding at the bottom of Haddon with shotguns and things like that. Well, you know, Tornbrook Heights was not a was not a. Uh, place was welcomed with uh, open hand by the citizens of Twinsburg. And some of the old times tell me that that uh, there was a movement to move to Twinsburg, the blacks out of Twinsburg Heights. And they went out and got guns and that type of thing and laid in the bushes on the Road waiting for them to come up and chase them out. So. They didn't want to enjoy guys to to exist. One kind of me. Now she's got to have two different kinds or else she cannot eat. I know when fair it was a luxury, she eat them boiled. It was quite a bit of prejudice. Yeah. yeah. A lot of it, not a quite a bit. I don't know what adjective you can use more than that. Yeah, it was a lot. It was but good. in the meantime, I think it was the older people because the kids got a long time, yeah, didn't yes. And we all yeah. carried our lunch in this big long, you remember the big long tables? Yeah. yeah. And we used to carry yeah. jelly and biscuits. Oh, Lord, yeah. <laughs> Lord, yes. I remember I used to be ashamed, and then I looked down, somebody else had jelly and biscuits, <laughs> you know, and they looked brown fat, you know. Yeah. All on one big long table, you know. Yeah. I remember when they built a swimming pool up behind the, the local high school. and. A bunch of us decided, new swimming pool, we're all going down to the swimming pool. But the moment we got there to the gates, they wouldn't admit us. And we looked and we were asking, well, why can't we get in? Because you live in the township. Well, we said, well, those kids are from the township. Those kids were white kids. We were only identifiable as being from the township because we were black. And blacks who lived in Twinsburg only lived in Twinsburg Heights. And I think that uh, restriction it's still in play today mm -hmm. that because it was built kind of with city money that township residents either have to pay an additional fee or are not allowed into that pool uh, to well, this day. You could go into the pool if you, if you spend it overnight in, uh, in the city. Family, in the family. <laughs> okay. So we had to kind of be squatters, no, uh, yeah. visitors yeah, right. uh, to Twinsburg City in order to, to stay there. How was it being one of the first black basketball players? Oh well, it wasn't. It wasn't bad, uh, you know. Uh, throughout the county, was a little different than it was in this township. Uh, we had, uh, oh, maybe one incident that I can really remember where uh, there was uh, any conflict, and that one that he threw pennies at us as we got off the bus. Relationships were good because as an athlete, which you know. A uh, relationship between the athlete and the, and the general public is different than just anyone, you know, so uh, we had no reason to.
were very small in number, but we were very powerful. So if there was something that we wanted, it would be from like the 12th grade to the 9th grade, we would uh, form walkouts. And then my mother worked at the community center. Um, Hubert's uncle, Luke White, worked at the center. Miss Barner, they would all come down to the school and support us in our walkout. During the mid, going toward the late 1960s, of course, the country was changing. Uh, we were going from a time where black folks were forced to be more laid back and, and docile, if you will, to a much more revolutionary spirit. And that spirit also happened here in Twinsburg. Uh, probably starting in 1967, there were disturbances out uh, there at the school. I remember some of my older brothers uh, having issues with some of the teachers. Part of the problem was that they felt as though we should be viewed as less than when we knew better. Our parents always taught us that we were equal to any human beings that walked the face of the earth. That was something that was impressed upon us, that we learned. But as we left Twinsburg Heights and came, as we called it, down the hill uh, to the school system, that changed. Because when you're constantly being told that you're not as good as, when you're being told that you have a different set of rules that apply to you than to the white students, it was a rebellious time. Uh, there were walkouts. Uh, the first walkout that I can remember uh, kind of orchestrated and participating. We demanded in 1968 a black studies program and the school agreed. The problem was they were going to have one of our social studies teachers who happened to be a very nice guy, but he was white. And we were trying to impress upon the administration that as well meaning as this person may be, how can a white person in 1968 teach black children about black history when we were in fact making black history during those times. So we did walk out. The challenges that I faced when I was going to high school, I remember two distinctly. One was uh, there was not African Americans in Chamberlain at that time. And we had, my one class, we had a Thanksgiving feast. And so I, it was my responsibility to bring the sweet potato pie. Well, it just so happened that I had forgotten the pie at home, or it could have been, I might have been a little embarrassed to bring it on the bus. So then I asked one of the girls in the class, I said, can you run me home so I can get the pie? And she said, sure, where do you stay? And I said, you know, I just stay up Twinsburg up front. And she went, do you stay in the Heights? And I said, yeah, I stay in the Heights. And she went, but I don't know if I want to go up there or not. And I said, why not? And then so she said, well, I don't think I can take you home to get that. That kind of made me feel didn't make me feel good, nor didn't make me feel comfortable. I remember sitting in some of the classrooms and different comments that would be made, and I would say, someone has to say something or this will continue. I remember growing up and not always feeling proud of being from the Heights because um, in the overall scheme of Twinsburg, oftentimes for some reason the Heights was known as the bad part of Twinsburg. So I remember, you know, feeling like, well, my neighborhood isn't that great, or I wish I lived in, I wish I lived down in Twinsburg, um, as it was often known. But as I've grown up, I've come to understand the importance of these small communities and how, you know, they really um, came and created their own environment, um, their own little anchor institutions to support one another and it's just really helped me understand the importance of you know working together with other people and just realizing um, the rich history that you know our people have. So what was your dad's job when he came up here? 
My hey. dad, you want to tell him? Go ahead. My dad did quite a few jobs. Uh, Avon, when he came up here, he worked as a um, contractor. You know, he, he worked at uh, factories. Uh, he helped, uh, you know, build, you know, apartment buildings, and uh, he did construction work. So he, he did quite a few jobs. But then he landed the best job that he ever had, and that was at Chrysler. He finally got a job at Chrysler. And he was in there, you know, doing assembly work. You know, I, I, helping with the uh, car parts. Go ahead, Julie. Um, I remember when he first got the job, we were living in, in the four-room house, and he was standing between two doors in the hallway, like, and um, in separate rooms. And he had his hand up, up, up against the wall, and he said, I got the job. And I and and mom of course was tall, but I can I could still hear him say that, and I could see him, and I I could feel the happiness and the the the, the excitement when he said he got the job, and and he said he got the job at Chrysler, and we all were so happy because we knew it meant more money. It was more. We we wasn't. It wasn't like we were starving for nothing. We were happy children, but it was just his excitement that caused us to be more happy because. Chrysler was a big thing back then. It was so, it was like everybody wanted to work for Chrysler. Yeah. And he worked there 32 years. Yep, he, he did. He was there 32 yep. years. He, he did. He bought a brand new car three years after he got the job. Yes, he did. A station wagon. As a matter of fact, it's still in the family now. I still have it at my house now. Yeah. So the, the wagon he bought in 67. It was a fur, furry, furry? Furry three. Furry Chrysler, three. Chrysler uh, mm -hmm. station wagon. And uh, we was excited about that car. I remember coming home, I was eight years old. I think I was eight years old. I remember coming home from school and I seen the car in the driveway and I was like, Dad got a new car? I said, man, Dad got a new car? I was so excited, man, <laughs> that Dad had a new car. My brother Lucian White, he was the cause of me to get a job at Chrysler. And he said, Liz, that's what he calls me, Liz. I said, yeah. He said, why don't you go up to Chrysler? Don't you want to go, you know, to Chrysler? I said, no. I thought I was working too hard. And they were talking about how much a fire we would be working in, you know. He said, go up there and try it. I said, I don't know. he said, well, I'm making up a list. I'm gonna put everybody's name on there that want to go up there. And they gonna hire everybody's name that be on the list, they gonna hire. He said, but you probably work a month and then you're gonna get laid off. You may not never go back. I said, okay, I'll try it. And sure enough, I did. And everybody's name on that list. And we, they were from the plant are out 82. People were lined up from Cleveland and everywhere. But they didn't know that the people up here was getting first charge. So when time for us to go in, they came and said, everybody from Twinsburg Heights, they come up, you know, to come up front. And the people started to fuss and they were mad. And well, I've been out here since this time. You know? And so we went on, they called us in, and they hired all, all of the people that was up here from the height, and uh, all the ones that wanted to go. And so I worked there 21 years. I worked there first. You want to talk about that a little? Yeah, I worked there 43 years and six months. You to tell me, you went through that asbestos thing, cancer thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, had, uh, I was diagnosed with lung cancer in 1999. Had a, a spot on my left lung, small cell cancer. They couldn't operate. But I went through chemo and radiation, and uh, I was in remission. I've been in remission ever since. 
Hopefully, God will bless me to stay in remission. Yeah, really. But I also had later on had <clears throat> prostate pro problems, as all uh, most black men have, and uh, I had th had that cancer, and I had to take uh, radiation sh shots for that. And my radiologist told me that I had 43 uh, shots of radiation, mm -hmm. and he told me that that's going to affect my ability physically. And it did. I couldn't walk near as far as I used to. I was very frightened when they told me I had that, that lung cancer. Right. Mm -hmm. They said about the size of a quarter. And I found out later that a lot of my, uh, I don't know what they call them, co-workers that worked at Chrysler also had cancer and didn't know it. Mm -hmm. And we tried to tell the union that something in that plant is causing cancer. Mm -hmm. So one day they had a screening across the street was our local union, and it was screening for asbestos and cancer. I went, tried to talk everybody into going, a lot of them didn't go, and they found, that's when they found the spot in my lung. And uh, I was blessed that uh, the guy said it's about the size of a quarter. Mm -hmm. But a lot of those guys that passed the place up, it's right kind of corner across the street. Mm -hmm. They later contracted cancer. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of the guys I work with never could, never drew a paycheck because they had they had cancer, mm -hmm. and when they got there, about the size of a of a softball, mm -hmm. and the, the guy says wow. too late to break it up. Mm -hmm. wow. I enjoy making the music for the documentary the most because uh, the software that we use is really fun to use and the people that um, are here accept me for what I do, which is making the music.